Looking ahead. Challenges and opportunities in the changing world. Welcome to Talking Economics, a podcast by the Center for Economic Research and Graduate Education, Economics Institute. When and why do national institutions change? Can some people who have been living under particular institutions, such as democracy, be crucial in changing institutions back home? Do national leaders matter? With our podcast guest Sebastian Ottinger, we will go back to European history, and from the perspective of political economy, we will discuss its relevance for institutional change in today's Russia or China. Sebastian has been an assistant professor at CERGI since September 2022. He is an applied microeconomist with research projects in the fields of ur- urban economics and political economy, and drawing on European and American economic history. He earned his PhD from UCLA Anderson School of Management in 2021. Welcome, Sebastian. Thank you for having me. Sebastian, you joined CERGI only recently, so can you maybe at the beginning tell us more about your research interests? Absolutely. So um, <clears throat> um, I'm mostly interested, as you said, in political economy, urban economics, all drawing on Europe, on economic history, both in Europe and the US. And with this, I basically I try to use historical data and quasi-experiments, things in history that are some arguably random, to answer questions that are interesting to econom- economists, to my fellow um, uh, researchers, but also to the broader public alike. Um, however, for the, all of the talk and all the questions we're going to talk about today, I want to give a big caveat. We can learn from history, but we must be very careful to draw parallels to the present. Just because something worked one, once in history, it doesn't mean it's going to play out the same today. So we have to be very careful when we learn from history and realizing that each and every episode is part of a very particular historical setting. I would like to, in today's talk, focus on uh, on uh, changes that we would like to th- see. The, the subtitle of our talk is Challenges and Opportunities in the Changing World. And there is a change we would like to see, right? We would like to see Russia changing from the empire state it is now, as we discussed with Gerard Roland in, in the previous episode, to, to democracy. So <clears throat> from your... Uh, research, based on your research, can you tell us more about uh, if this change would be possible? What what have we learned from history? And why are we always talking about Putin? Is he such an important person? Are yeah. the kings making a difference? Are the leaders making a difference for mm. the countries? Mm. Let's say, um, um, let's get to the first thing. Let's get to the first two, institutional change. I mean, saying we want to see institutional change. Everyone here would like to see t- um, Russia to become a normal democracy and um, be not, not, not attacking its neighbors at free will, at the, at the wills of, of, of one random leader. So um, what we know in economics and in science more broadly is that national institutions, such as democracy, they matter. They matter for economic growth, but they also might have an intris- intrinsic value in itself. I like living in a democracy, my voice being heard, and I imagine that the people of Russia would like to have normal elections as well and be able to vote and um, and have um, and have i mean security for their own for all these things for for their, for their lives as well um what we know in in from history is that institutions can be very persistent so there's a famous paper by Asimoglu and his co-authors in 2001 where they show that institutions that initially had better institutions uh, co- colonies that had better institutions they tend to have better institutions even today so institutions can be very persistent over the long run. I mean, France is now in this fifth iteration of a republic, but they still have their republic. Um, Germany might be a worse example, but I mean, even in 1848, you had that kind of um, democratic revolutions in Germany that just happened to fail. And then there was a try at um, institutions, at different institutions. So we know from German history and others that institutions can sometimes change very quickly. And this usually happens alongside public protests or like um, people kind of speaking up their voices want to, to see change. So some, some examples come to mind. I mean, um, think about the, um, the fall of communism. I mean, we're in Prague here, so kind of this, is, um, this was just a few hundred meters kind of to our side. This was where a lot of the protests happened to bring down the communist regime in this country. So did it in other places all around the, um, the former Eastern Bloc. I mean, the rise of Nazism as well. I mean, the Nazis rise to power was also accompanied by public support in the streets, mm-hmm. not by the vast majority, but by some. And the Arab Spring as well. I mean, the Arab Spring is an example of where it failed. 
And the Nazi example shows that basically it must not always be a change for the better. And Russia is also one of the examples here, right? Because there was a change in the fall of, fall of communism was a chance for them to change and it didn't quite succeed, right? Exactly. And it didn't play out. And that's an important question because we we too often take it for granted that change goes to the better. So we all would like to see these countries coming from worse regimes, coming to them, mm -hmm. becoming more democratic. But there's, there's little we know about. For, so for we know that um, we... Um, we think um, that we know some factors and c that can trigger institutional change. So institutions can change at an, very quickly if they want to, only rarely so. And we know some triggers for that. So an economic kind of um, decline, like a crisis is, is a thing. People have like um, uh, a paper on Africa and rainfall. I mean, kind of, if you have more rain, kind of, or less rain, it affects your, your economy. And then this kind of can drive an, a window of opportunity for democratic change. Um, but also a political crisis. Looking at Russia, for instance, I mean, a failed war is an example for an, for could be something that would trigger institutional change due to public unrest at home. Um, so that's how we could replace it to a, to relate it to a current debate. Um, yeah. The question is, you need people to drive the change, right? And it seems that uh, very many people uh, and probably people who would be able to drive the change are leaving Russia. Right? Exactly. And um, so is it good or is it bad? I mean, it could be both things. I mean, and the one thing it could be that basically, well, all these people who have could have driven change, they might leave now and not be able to be in a country when change, when it would be required for them to speak up and organize protests. On the other hand, these people might come back and where they go, they might see experience, they might experience different institutions, which is exactly um, very close to the paper I've been writing with a co-author of mine on the French Revolution where basically people who have seen a different set of institutions then bring the change home. Even though they've been to another place, as they return, they change institutions at home. So that is um, joint work with Lukas Rosenberger, who is a postdoc at Northwestern University. An important note here that it's not published, and so it has not been peer-reviewed. So basically, this is currently the opinion of Lukas and I, so um, and some other people who have seen the paper. Um, so what we do in this paper is we look at the French Revolution, at the French Revolution, 1792, arguably one of the most important institutional changes in history. I mean, kind of all revolutions afterward drew inspiration from this. People kind of people who liked the revolution say like, well, this is how you make it happen. People who didn't like it tell like, well, it ended in Napoleon, the guy who conquered all of Europe. So again, it shows you that it must not even in the aftermath. Once you have established democracy, it might just not be stable. But um. What we're interested in is um, what drives, what caused the French Revolution, in a mm -hmm. sense. And that's a big question in history. And um, there's various factors. You know, there was an economic crisis, as now kind of there was a, f a king who basically um, had repeatedly failed in his endeavors to conquer other places. And then, um, or a kind of in war and his, his, yeah, his government finances were ruined, kind of his, um, his government balance with the other, with the, with the lords was seriously broken. What we're after is a particular um, cause of it. And the cause we're talking about is a few soldiers, a few thousand mm -hmm. soldiers. So these few thousand soldiers uh, are what the king sent to, um, to the United States. So 10 years before the French Revolution, the Americans tried to win their independence from the United Kingdom. And so doing so, they um, the French king he didn't like democracy per se, or he didn't like the Americans to kind of have their own democracy. What he what he liked was that someone annoyed the British <laughs> king. So in the idea of like the enemy of, of an enemy is a friend, he was like, well, let's support the Americans. And so the initial plan was to send a few thousand, so 15,000 soldiers to fight um, to invade England. So they settled, they created an army combined with the Spanish. And then the idea was like, well, we're going to then sail and invade England as people have done from Normandy repeatedly. <laughs> so they figured, well, let's do this again. Um, the problem was that the, Spains didn't, the Spaniards didn't show up. And then these 15,000 soldiers were there and they were like, well, we cannot really use them to fight kind of them in England because they're not enough. So what they decided then is to take some of these soldiers and bring them to the United States to help mm -hmm. the Americans fight the Brits on their own soil. Mm -hmm. Now these soldiers move to the US. They go, to, they go by, um, by, by, by ship, obviously. 
no no planes back then <laughs> so it took a while um and as they arrived they basically spent a year in in new england and um i mean if you're a french soldier usually from the countryside your um your parents might have been farmers or you kind of um you come yeah. from a place that is very it's not very democratic to put it the least i mean you have to pay feudal dues to your overlords um there's a lot of control mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's just not a very democratic society it's absolutism at its height and um, in the U.S., they see something very different. In the U.S., they see small-scale farms, people that are small but rich farmers who don't have to pay insanely high taxes, um, who are free in their right to assembly, who are kind of where people are talking. Mm -hmm. Exactly, where people are talking about independence and democracy. And then these people are there for like two years. They fight one important battle. They see all of the U.S., all of the U.S. that mattered back then, namely all of the seaboard. And then they return. And what we show is that once they return where they are from, those are the places where 10 years later, the revolution is far stronger. Mm -hmm. So this is where, for instance, you have, um, you have more protests against the regime, against the feudal regime. Um, you have more volunteers who then kind of um, um, become part of the democratic army, of the, of the revolutionary army. Um, you have more societies, political societies, that basically try to think about how do we organize this revolution, what system do we want. And then later on afterwards, you have more of the former elites of the mm -hmm. old system, thinking about oligarchs in Russia now, for instance, that had to flee. So basically across the regions in France, these soldiers drove institutional change back home. Impressive. And so you think that this is something that we could observe or this is something that is transferable to other situ situations. I mean, um, there's the usual caveat that apply in that history it doesn't repeat itself. It might not even rhyme. Is mm -hmm. that um, uh, I think we can learn something from this about the prospect of institutional change in Russia. So people have recently, I mean, Putin's mobilization was a um, has some issues in the fact that, for instance, for every soldier that he recruited to fight and die in Ukraine, um, two Russians of the same age left Russia. Mm -hmm. So, um, so these impressive people, result, yeah, yeah, it's an impressive result for mobilization. I mean, it tells you that the people are really convinced by this war, or at least some do. At least they don't want to kind of put their own lives on uh, up for it. So, um, so I mean, these people you could argue can also like the French soldiers, and um, in a way that they are exposed to different institutions, they can see how things work in different places. So. I mean, back in Germany, also here in the Czech Republic, there's a bit of discussion, should we let these Russians in? The kind of in, in, in the Czech yes. Republic, they've mm -hmm. decided we don't want them. In Germany, we let some in. I'm not sure how exactly how. So the, um, the thing is, I mean, there's an argument for letting them in. Because um, if these people are fleeing Russia, they might not even, even if they're not democratically motivated. Even they are definitely not supporters, or, or most of them. Or they might just fear for their own lives. But the thing mm -hmm. is, um, coming back to our French soldiers, I mean, these people... They didn't, I mean, they were not convinced um, Democrats, and that's why they fought, uh, why they came to the US. Instead, they were made convinced people who wanted to change the institutions mm -hmm. back at home once the opportunity arose, um, just because they've been censored by force. It's actually, the history is funny about here, about this, because, I mean, people were concerned, well, maybe these French soldiers, they could just be selected. They could just be, well, I want to see institutional change. I want to see the US. So the funny thing in this case is the soldiers didn't know it. They learned it on the ship. Wow, okay. So they didn't even know that they're going to the US. So only on the ship they learned and they were very happy that they don't have to go to fight in England. Yeah. And it's the same with the Russian, um, the people who leave Russia now. Because I mean, um, then it's not it's not exactly the same because they know kind of um, where they, where where they might want to go. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I mean, the hope here is that um, as these people move into into um into europe into the part of us that have our uh, endangered but stable democracies maybe they will learn something about kind of things that they would like to see you know even if these people didn't move if someone just wanted to save his life running away from um, conscription once you live in um, a random small village in, in baden-württemberg for a long enough time you might appreciate the things that are that things are running well and you might think well maybe this has something to do with the fact with the set of institutions that people have over here and even so, you just ran away trying to save your life, just not trying to get conscripted. You might become convinced that democracy might be 
have its benefits and you wouldn't have known this before. The caveat to the historical setting here is obviously that these people could know some of these things because you have internet now and they can read mm -hmm. them up, which wasn't the case in the times of the French Revolution. But to live through these things and, and read about them on the internet, I think it's very different. <laughs> exactly. The different personal experience. exposure is very mm -hmm. different. I agree. Mm -hmm. Um, then the question is whether they will uh, choose to return, right? Because uh, this is, I think, a big threat that they will not be willing to go back. As, uh... Exactly. Once you've kind of established a life for yourself somewhere else, why would you kind of easily, especially mm. returning into a, a, a time when you would need these people the most, when there's institutional change, this is all the time when you have, when people... Um, get locked up in prison when there's violence on the streets. Exactly. So yeah, but I mean there could be a selective migration, is it? I mean, kind of, um, a lot of people um leave Russia, um, if we let them in and let them ex expose them to our um systems, political and economic. Um, some of them might return. Some of them might have been convinced in the first place, and they would always return to Russia and kind of um try to drive change as soon as the opportunity arises. But maybe there's a small set of say ten percent wouldn't have done so and wouldn't have done so if they would have gone to a different place. Say, I don't know, I don't want to make, I don't want to point out, point <laughs> to particular countries, but because we didn't let a lot of them in and there's some issues in getting into Europe, some of them went to like places like uh, like Kazakhstan and, and um, Turkey. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you could make the argument that it's um, maybe less of those people that these countries are willing to fight for democracy back home. Mm -hmm. So it's an mm -hmm. argument to basically let these people in, even if they're not convinced Democrats already. Because you might turn this is what you are such. changing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so this is something that you say may even have some implications for uh, migration from China or changing um, the Chinese situation. I mean, there's a, um, I mean, um, there's a, there's also the potential you could say. Um, we, again, we have to be careful with drawing historical parallels. But um, in the U.S., we had um, like the, a lot of U.S. universities had a lot of Chinese students. I mean, Chinese students in the mm -hmm. upper middle class. Um, it was a nice thing to get a U.S. degree from, say, the University of Iowa and, um, and many other good universities. So the, the point here is that um, in the recent, say, years with the recent, with the last presidency, there were some issues and should we cut them, um, should we cut this migration? Um, should we be careful on who these migrants are? And it's the same, like, um, even nowadays with kind of increased, you would say, international systems competition where the U.S. now sees China and declares it an international competitor. And they might be less, um, might be more reluctant to let Chinese people into the United States and let them study there. And there is an obvious threat. I mean, these people could study things, learn things, and then take this knowledge back to their, um, back to China and help China establish a technological lead. Being stronger, actually. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But there's also the other thing. I mean, these people, um, if you truly believe in your own system and say, well, kind of, well, we have a nice system here in the US and people can vote and there's some um, those benefits to be had that you cannot just as easily do in China. Um, then, I mean, um, uh, some of these people might, even though they were like, just like the sons of some party, um, or sons or daughters of some party leaders, they might return and might've been exposed to something different and realize, well, maybe democracy is not as bad as it could be. Mm -hmm. And then again, you always need these trigger factors. Like in Russia, you need a political crisis. I mean, no one who's been, who's sitting in Baden-Württemberg now working for, um, uh, say, uh, Porsche will decide to just return now when nothing is happening. But once you have these trigger factors, these people might decide to kind of speak up, like with the French um, soldiers. I mean, these people have been living in France and for like five to ten years. Until and something happened. happened. Mm -hmm. Until something mm -hmm. big happened. Until something, some external trigger factors. And I would also argue that what we're talking about are relatively few people, right? Like if uh, the, the Chinese students, it's just a drop in an ocean, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, 10,000 French soldiers is also not a major number. It's yep. relatively few, but, uh, but that's maybe the additional uh, marginal change that you need. I mean, this is about, about um, social leaders. Is it? It's about some people who can then... I mean, yes, in the end, it's just a very few people. I mean, history writes about few people, but it doesn't mean that a lot of people didn't do anything, you know? Like, I mean, we remember Václav Havel, but there were thousands and hundreds of thousands of people all over the country doing things. So it's, um, and similar with this, I mean, um, uh, but we know that leaders matter and partially only because they um, concentrate expectations. So basically, um, even just a few people can make a difference, um, even if it's in non-political events. So um, for instance, um, in the US, um, we, we know that a few thousand, a few hundred actually, 
German emigrants from the, that's not my paper, that's a paper by a colleague, by a friend of mine, a few thousand, a few hundred people, German political leaders who failed in the 48 revolution in 1848, they came to the US and then 10 years later, as the opportunity arose, they helped in the civil war in recruiting soldiers. And these few hundred recruited thousands and thousands of soldiers. So we know that even a few people can make a difference. So coming back to the Chinese or the Russians, yes, maybe it's only 10 people we need to actually drive this and organize this change back in Russia. But if we, if we allow these people to stay among mm -hmm. us and kind of get exposure and kind of advertise our institutions to them and have them see it firsthand, we might have a higher chance to get this one of 5,000 who will actually drive the change. Perfect. Uh, you, you mentioned here the that we know that leaders matter. So this is maybe the uh, time to move to the second part of the uh, talk we wanted to talk about. And that is, do we know, how do we know that leaders matter? Yeah. And uh, it seems that the war is all about uh, Mr. Putin and the fact that there are some institutions in Russia is not changing anything. So seems that we see that leaders matter, but what about your research? And so um, this is an age-old question, actually. And I mean, the historians have, in the early years, I mean, since 200 years, at least people have been writing about us. Do individuals make a difference in history? I mean, think about Napoleon, who as one person overthrew kind of the French, whatever it was back then, when he over overthrew it and established himself as emperor, and then changed history in various ways. I mean, conquering half of Europe, I mean, even making it to Moscow. And um, and then and then kind of them being cut short, so um, these so we and there's a lot of historians that have written about do these leaders matter? Do they make a difference? And the best we have in terms of like for the last say up until 15 years ago was correlations. So people would look at well, um, here's a good leader, and like for for American presidents, for instance, someone um, recorded IQs for them. He didn't ask them because most of these people were dead, so he just assumed it basically. And then he showed that smarter um, leaders are better for the country. Namely, the US grew more or kind of had a more successful period. There's a big problem with that because basically, um, uh, there's an endogeneity, what we call an endogeneity, in that these things are jointly determined. So maybe in times when, when times are bad, people will vote for a bad leader. And then it's not that the bad leader kind of causes the bad state of the country, but it's just because he was voted for this. Or maybe because the leader did something very well, the historian then says, well, this guy must have been very smart. So you really see we and have a... Cuts both, both ways, yeah. Exactly, cuts both ways. So we don't really know if it's... And that's actually a historical debate. Do leaders influence their times or do times influence the leaders? I mean, every non every non scientist and every person in the world knows that it's probably both ways. But as scientists, we're interested in which of this is it. And so the best we've had until recently in terms of identification, in terms of like, can we actually make one of these arrows between how, 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 some, how good are leaders or do leaders matter and the times. The best we had was a paper by Jones and Olkin in 2005, where they looked at the arguably random deaths of an African dictator or like national mm -hmm. leaders. Mostly it's dictators somewhere. I mean, I'm... Yeah, I hear the laughter basically in a sense that, well, the arguably random death of a national leader. I mean, this is, I mean, I do believe that the current Pope died of natural causes, but I wouldn't kind of <laughs> sign this for all historical popes. So <laughs> leaders might kind of get out of the way by not just by natural deaths, by natural causes. Mm -hmm. So they try to look at this and they um, identify some cases where it's arguably that, well, it was just a heart attack, you know. And then they look at around the time when this person died. How did the growth rate of the country change? And they find that there was a significant change, meaning mm -hmm. that this leader had a bearing on the country, how well the country did. So, I mean, this is a super important first step, and it's a seminal paper, widely cited, also beyond economics. So what we're doing is we, um, we wonder there's a bunch of open questions, because with this, we know that leaders matter somewhere around when they, um, when they basically die or before and after. Mm -hmm. But... Um, we don't know really why those leaders matter. So one thing that people have put forward is that, well, it might make a difference whether your country is run by someone smart or by someone not so smart. The prime example I used to use for this was um, saying, you can have your country run by a, someone with a physics PhD, 
Merkel was the idea, and um, or by someone whose father had to buy him into the Wharton School of Business, <laughs> Trump. I mean, nowadays I cannot make this because we see that Trump had some right points on on the Ukrainian or on the Russian part, and Merkel was victim to him um, to I don't know wrong assessments or wrong um uh, so um but the basic idea is is still that maybe it is a kind of someone smarter just kind of runs the country better and um, but that's very hard to show because i mean you don't know how um you, and you i mean leaders come to power and fortunately they are elected for the better so what we're doing is and this is joined with nico Wurklander, who's a uh, who, who's a, a co-author of mine um, and we have a project where we look into a very particular historical setting to make progress on this. So what we look at is um, European monarchs. So basically, we look at a time from, say, a thousand to, um, to Napoleon, 1800. And we came across a list of basically the whoever was um, the leader of, we have 13 countries in total, like kind of the major powers of the time, um, France, England, Portugal, um, uh, many other places. No, we know for each time when a leader was in power and then we see how well this leader kind of how well the country did under um the, the reign of the leader what does it mean how the country did or that's a good well? question so we have several measures for this the so first thing is i mean this is a time of um of of the from the middle ages to the early modern time period so what we have there is one is an assessment by an historian who just read how well did the country do by historians by other people by contemporaries assessment how well did Spain do during the reign of, of uh, Charles III, for instance? And he ranked the countries? Or oh, he just he made it like um, good, okay. mm -hmm. unclear, or bad. Okay. So very mm -hmm. simple. We do something else. We also look at, did these countries, did their area grow? Like, was the country successful in conquering other territories? Or was it kind of getting smashed by their neighbors? Mm -hmm. Or um, also, um, did the cities in the country, did they grow? So kind of, um, we take urban population as an indicator for um, for economic progress back at this time. It's the best indicator we have for that. So what we do with that then is then basically just to first show a correlation, like other people have done. We have this rankings of the leaders saying this leader was good, Charles II was bad, Charles III was good. And then we see that within the same country, when Spain was ruled by Charles II, it did terribly. And when it was ruled by a uh, reign, reigned by uh, Charles III, it did well. But well, that's just a correlation. All these concerns we had earlier on. Well, maybe it's just because um, the, the country did well, and then they said the leader was smart. So there are big concerns that we cannot really, so it could still cut both ways. Or there might be something else, you know, maybe there's an economic crisis. You define the quality of the leader by the result of, of uh, its reign, right? So that it's... could be the con concern, exactly. So you need something that really mm. um, tells you whether a leader is, is capable or not. Yeah. And here we use another nice feature of European history, which we don't have today for the better, which is, I mean, kings didn't get elected. Kings in most cases. I mean, there's cases like the Commonwealth of Poland, Polish Lithuania in some places, and even the Holy German Empire, where they were elected, even though you wouldn't call it a democracy because it was just elected by a few people. But um, usually kings came to power because they were the oldest son of the former king. Mm -hmm. So you have a very clear order, like, here's your next king. And the beautiful part that we're exploiting is that, um, so these people are fixed. Who becomes the next king is very well known. And then these kings kind of um, vary in their ability because of inbreeding. And that's the cool part. So these European monarchs did one thing, which is they married, um, in, they made, made marriages and they made them kind of within their broader kin networks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the prime example are the Habsburg who repeatedly had uncle and nieces marry, <laughs> where I think one of the husbands had to convince his wife not to call him uncle all the time. I mean, that's the case over there. But I mean, it's all in other cases in Europe. And what we know nowadays, but we didn't know back then, is that inbreeding actually like kind of, um, if you're the offspring of someone who married with someone um, uh, very close genetically, that is actually bad for you. I mean, there's a lot of things, but one of the things that is well documented is intelligent. Mm -hmm. intelligence. So basically, if you marries, if you'd be the um, offspring of, um, of say, uncle and niece, you'd be quite less smart on average, not always, but on average, mm -hmm. than someone else who wouldn't. And so now we can use this to basically, so we have a random order of kings who comes to power because they're just the next born, the next, just the son. And then we have them varying in ability. 
So you were able to actually detect the the level of inbreeding for every of these kings you had. Exactly. It's easier wow. than it sounds because um, these people were um, recording family trees and some enthusiasts on the internet have um, like medieval age enthusiasts, you might say, and historians too, have recorded these um, the relationships mm -hmm. between those people to an extremely well, extremely sufficient degree. So you can basically see how, what was the degree of inbreeding, as you call it, the coefficient of inbreeding. How was it for, say, Charles II? Charles II mm -hmm. of Spain, for instance, has an inbreeding coefficient of 25, which is, which doesn't tell you anything else now, but, it, but what it means is that basically his, um, he was as, as um, inbred as the offspring of siblings. So if two siblings would have an offspring, mm -hmm. this would be as bad as kind of what happened with Charles II. Even though his parents were only, you might say, uncle and niece. Mm -hmm. But it's because in later generations, for several generations, they, they were doing been, the same. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's hidden in the, in, the, in the pedigree, deeper in the family, I'm in the mm -hmm. relationship network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what, what, what we use this for is then to show two things. First, inbreeding, actually, even with our measure of, of how capable these monarchs were, inbreed leaders tend to do worse. I mean, Charles II is just an example. I mean, he ended the Habsburgs in Spain and then, I mean, threw Spain into a, quite a crisis. But, um, uh, yeah, so they're basically, they're, um, inbreed leaders tend to be bad, not just for the few examples, but also for, like, for all the 250 kings that we have this information for. And we find that um, less, uh, more inbred kings tend to, tend to, be, um, tend to be worse ru rulers. Mm -hmm. And now we can use this because it's arguably not driven by how well the country was doing because these marriage decisions were made two generations before, five generations before. So we can use it to see what actually is the bearing of, um, of capable leaders on the performance of their state. So that, um, does it make a difference if your country is run by someone smart? And it does. I mean, and it's really not because these kind of smart people get elected, but we find that incapable rulers um, tend to be very bad for the country. I mean, they're sizable. We find that they're like... 20% less, I mean, uh, under a good good ruler, the country grows by 20%. Under a bad one, it doesn't grow by this amount. So we really see that the um, these kings matter, these leaders. And we, I mean, it's um, it's important to um, to have the caveat here. I mean, these are like a few hundred European kings. We don't want to extrapolate from them to nowadays yeah. because we don't have kings and they're for the better. Some countries seem to be operating in a similar fashion, right? Uh... You're talking about Belarus. In... <laughs> or the bigger brother. <laughs> yeah, but in Russia, I mean, it's not clear who's the successor, is it? I mean, kind of the question is who's the next successor. So I think in Belarus, he recently... Um, so you could see a world where the son of the of Lukashenko marries the... the and, and Putin kind of um, has, his, has his daughter following up, and then you could create like a... But that's unlikely. I mean, like, yes, these countries <laughs> are dictatorships, or like, but they're not... But they're not. They don't have this inbreeding component, which we. Which we but we can measure intelligence now in different ways, right? I think one of the problems, or why did you need to rely on inbreeding, was that you were not able to measure their capability in any other way. Yep. Uh, but it's difficult. I mean, kind of even from the outside, we're still arguing about whether someone was smart or not. Kind of, it's very difficult from the. Even if you wouldn't, you could invite him to an intelligence test. I mean, we can, you can do this for the next podcast, invite Putin for intelligence test. I'm, I'm not sure well, he will sign up and then you need someone to do the test. Um, you're right. This is a difficult question. Trump went for an intelligence test. <laughs> yeah, but then he was just capable of him. Um, I did. think it was a very simple test. I haven't, I haven't followed the news in that, but I think it was a very simple test. Um, so going back to the topic. Leaders do matter. That's the conclusion of the paper. They make a difference for the success of the country. What about the institutions? So are the institutions relevant? We talk about the institutions at the start. Yes. So um, these institutions do still matter. I mean, um, in our sample, it's mostly like kind of very powerful kings with few constraints on them and what they can do. So if you're the king of, of Spain, you just do what you want in a mm -hmm. sense. Um, I mean, you still have some caveats, some, some things you have to be aware of, some, some trade-offs. But um, a nice feature of what other people have shown as well is that um, once you have better institutions that constrain the king, so we're not talking about democracy, we're talking about something that just makes the king have to, having to answer to someone, to kind of, um, here's the action I'm doing and here's why I'm doing it, and someone controlling the king, basically. So in our setting, this is mostly parliaments. So think of kind of in England after about... Um, 1680 and, and after the 17th century, the king was less and less powerful. 
So whatever he did, kind of he had to kind of check with the parliament and then kind of he was basically us for the better now, the king in, in England is still today. Um, they were not really making a lot of policy, but they were um, they were constrained by the parliament. So what we show is that yes, while leaders matter, having a good leader, causally in a sense, kind of having a good leader drives um, the performance of the country. This really kind of depends on the institutions. As soon as you have strong parliaments, the king doesn't matter any longer. So as soon as you have like a parliament that does all the reigning kind of and takes takes care of if the king does something stupid, they say, well, I, yeah, no, you don't get the money for this. Um, then the leaders don't matter. And that also kind of um, basically um, mirrors in what is found in modern studies as well. So even today you find that um, uh, leaders in, in the same in the study I talked about before, mm -hmm. if the places are more democratic, the leaders don't really matter. So uh, leaders matter, but we like to have the institutions to constrain them. So this is another argument for having democracy, actually. Exactly. One of many arguments. One of them is that basically it enables you to um, constrain, control your leaders. Um, our leaders cannot do everything they want. They get elected every f every few years again. And there's a parliament that makes sure that they don't do anything stu too stupid. So even if they're bad or if they become bad, we can get rid of them very quickly, which is something very different from, say, in Russia or Turkey or in other places where they try to stay in power for longer or for European monarchies where they stayed in power for life. Perfect. That's, I think, an important lesson that we, we learn from history. And I would conclude here. So st thank you, Sebastian, for joining us and sharing with us your research and insights. My great pleasure. Thank you for having me.